Hello, everyone. Dr. Stillman here with Clark Engelbert. And today we are going to be talking about copper toxicity, unraveling the hidden dangers and nurturing optimal health. So for those of you who don't know, I'm Dr. Leland Stillman. This is Clark Engelbert. I have a medical practice and a coaching practice. Clark and I teamed up recently to run a course on hair tissue mineral analysis and mineral balancing. Clark runs nutrition analytics, where he also does hair tissue mineral analysis. And we wanted to sit down today to dispel some of the confusion surrounding copper out there in the health and wellness info space, because we see people getting this massively and colossally wrong and setting their patients, clients, friends, family, and themselves up for failure when it comes to loading up on copper. So Clark, thanks for joining me today. I'm excited to get into it. Is there any particular place where you want to start or anything you want to add to that intro? Um, you know, what I would say is, uh, when it comes to copper, you know, first we want to just consider copper as an element first and understand there are inherent characteristics to copper that make it somewhat difficult to measure on various diagnostic testing. Right. And so understanding some of those basics, I think are, are really important. Copper can shift in between oxidation states. This is part of why it's useful in the body for many, uh, cupro enzymes, um, as an electron donor, but this is also one reason why copper can become toxic um, pretty quickly as well. So, um, but also very important to know, I would say just off the bat that copper and ceruloplasmin are acute phase reactants, meaning that they just respond very sensitively to inflammation and various inflammatory processes. So this is part of the inherent nature of uh, the copper element itself that makes it difficult to measure. Um, and especially in the serum, it's very, very difficult to measure for this reason. Uh, you know, any amount of inflammation that you have from, let's say, an infection or low grade metal toxicity or smoking or even birth control can skew ceruloplasmin upwards in the serum and influence really um, the measurement of copper, basically. Um, right. So just understanding some of those inherent characteristics about copper and the, how that leads to difficulty in measuring copper status is a really, really important sort of foundational principle of copper. Um, you know, and we can get into the specifics of uh, using hair analysis to measure copper, but even on hair analysis, it's not exactly straightforward how we measure copper status. Looking strictly at the copper level sometimes can be uh, misleading for those reasons that I just mentioned as well. Right. And so the key here is to understand that what you're seeing in a test may not necessarily reflect what's going on in the whole system. Mm -hmm. And so I found measuring levels of copper in patients' blood that they often had an elevated or high normal copper level. When I mm -hmm. treated that and chased that copper out or down, depending on how you look at it, they would often see profound improvements in their health. And there are many different ways that we can do that. We can use certain minerals. We can use like vitamin C, things like sauna, increased hydration, changing their diet. All these things will help, right? Mm -hmm. Certain supplements can play a role. But I found that I was getting my patients better by reducing their serum copper. Now, then I started to do hair tissue mineral analysis, and I found that people had low levels of copper in their hair on a regular basis, and I mm. thought that was odd. I'm treating these people for copper toxicity, and a great book on that is Why Am I Always So Tired by Louise Gittleman. Yes. And I'm getting my patients better. Their numbers look better. Their symptoms are better. They have better energy. They're more balanced. They're more focused. Everything is better. I don't think there's any question that I was, wasn't getting people into a better place physiologically. Mm -hmm. And then their copper level in their hair would actually shoot up. Mm. So it would double, triple, quadruple, because all of a sudden they were actually excreting that copper. And this really uh, confused me for a long time. It didn't confuse me. It just sort of boggled my mind how right. the body is this big potential space. Most people don't think about this, but in very s simple terms, if you look at the body as let's call it, you know, a 150 to 200 pound, you know, uh, uh, space for a man, let's say, mm -hmm. well, they might only have a hundred or 120 milligrams of copper. That's yeah. one milligram, less than one milligram per pound. Let's say it's a woman, right. 120 pounds, just to make the math easy, right. one milligram per pound of copper. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. So 
when you start to skew those numbers and you start to increase the amount of copper, mm. and this was another thing that I saw in my practice, I would have these patients with very elevated coppers who were not eating a lot of copper. Mm -hmm. And it didn't make sense to me that they were, and this, uh, the case I actually remember most vividly was a patient who was hospitalized for a prolonged period of time and had a very poor life expectancy because she had very severe end stage disease. Mm. She had one of the highest copper levels I've ever seen. Mm. And it, it's, it dawned on me that this number in the blood was a manifestation of her body starting to dump copper into the blood because it couldn't use it. And mm -hmm. this gets into this concept that's so critical for people to understand, which is it's not just about the minerals that are in the system. It's about whether or not they're being used. Mm. So a mineral is a little bit like a loaded gun. Mm. It's perfectly safe if it's pointed in the right direction, right. but it, you point it in the wrong direction right. and maybe start a kitchen fire, all of a sudden it starts going off right. and untoward, um, unfortunate, side effects then arise because you'll see in the literature this very interesting these very interesting competing uh, ideas about copper particularly in brain health mm -hmm. so if you look at at the brains of patients who've had certain types of neurodegenerative disorders specifically alzheimer's disease you'll see that they have high quantities of copper in the brain mm -hmm. this would lead the logical mind to conclude that Alzheimer's disease is a disease of excess copper. Therefore, copper restriction will reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. However, mm -hmm. you will also find that these patients have a low level of ceruloplasmin in the, in the blood, which is basically our marker for how well can the body kind of harness the wild horse that is copper and mm -hmm. actually put it to use. In this analogy, right, with the loaded gun, it's pointing the lo loaded gun in the right direction. So the mm -hmm. loaded gun and the bullet in the loaded gun does what you want it to do, which is annihilate something that you want to get rid of, right? Maybe not a great analogy for like around the house. Uh, <laughs> you know, for most of you watching this at home who are not regularly having to use lethal force in the Don't home, I'll come up with another analogy later, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but okay, what you're talking about though really does reflect something quite important, which is that yes. there are exquisite mechanisms, underlying mechanisms that really control copper partitioning and metabolism and uh, you know ceruloplasmin is most notably uh or most famously involved in that process but there are other things that affect copper metabolism and partitioning yes uh thyroid hormone this is something that people don't know but we touched on this yesterday or i want to say maybe not yesterday but maybe a couple weeks ago when we recorded the thyroid mm -hmm. uh webinar yes um, is and that that's in our htma course, by the way, which you can find at stillmanwellness.com. Clark Check. and I run that. We're running that right now. And by, for the record, by the way, I, I should, should maybe have mentioned this, but Clark and I decided to sit down and do this because there was so much interest in hair tissue, mineral analysis and mineral balancing. And Clark and I are both doing that basically full time mm -hmm. because we've both over the course of, you know, our own health in journeys and, and, and problems. And then, you know, myself as a medical doctor and Clark as a practitioner with a background in biochemistry, we both arrived at mineral balancing through hair tissue mineral analysis as the single best thing we could find to help people. And so we put together this course with a coaching program that you can find out more about if you're interested. And then we decided to start doing these monthly webinars tentatively scheduled at 4 PM first Thursday of each month. Uh, these are free. They're streamed to YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, where we help people understand these mineral dynamics. And if you want more information, you can sign up for our course. Uh, and at the very least, we hope this is helpful to you because we know you're being inundated with content like mm. take beef liver and eat a high mm. copper diet and don't eat red meat, which is rich in zinc, uh, which is going to balance out your copper as we're going to talk about here today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Yes, definitely. Um, the, so to go back quickly to thyroid hormone, mm -hmm. um, this is something that many people don't understand, but thyroid hormone is required to activate ceruloplasmin in the liver. Mm -hmm. So the initiation, the synthesis of ceruloplasmin is initiated by signals coming from thyroid hormone. So there's an interplay, not only, and we can get into this later uh, on this webinar, but there's an interplay between all the elements Right. right. And the interactions oftentimes are far more interesting than just individual mineral levels or just the status of one mineral. 
but your hormones uh, play a large role in this symphony or orchestra as well. And so thyroid hormone is very important for ceruloplasmin activation. If you have thyroid uh, disturbances for any reason, right? If you have heavy metals, if you have low iodine, if you have low selenium, all very common imbalances, this can affect thyroid hormone. Uh, and then that will affect ceruloplasmin synthesis. And then if you don't have enough ceruloplasmin in the liver, the copper that you're getting in your diet is not going to be bound to anything so that it can be partitioned correctly throughout the body and you will end up with copper toxicity. Right. Just by virtue of that one imbalance alone, that's sort of independent of your copper intake. Um, so these imbalances can take many different shapes and forms because of these interactions that exist between the hormones, the, uh, the metal binding proteins like ceruloplasmin, and then the other elements as well, uh, which is maybe another uh, thing that we can talk about is really the interactions between copper um, and, and these other elements, which are when we use the hair test, we can use interactions to measure copper status much more precisely and then therefore make much more precise recommendations for either copper supplementation or to stay away from copper supplementation because there's this there's this other notion out there now um, in the alternative health space that either copper is like the savior, it's going to save you from every single modern Western condition, or copper is a poison. And there's yeah, exactly. We you know we won't name names here, but uh, we, you know we know some of the people out there that are espousing yeah. both of these extreme sort of views. Mm. And the, the truth is actually in the middle where. For some people, copper can save their life in the short Absolutely. term. Absolutely. And I've seen it happen. Um, you know, and but in other populations and other people, uh, copper can actually make them much worse. Taking supplemental high dose copper can make them much worse. So um, I think maybe that would be a really good point to um, expand on, really get into the interactions and how we use HTMA to precisely measure what you should be taking in terms of copper. Um, I think right. that would be and one thing that I want to share with people that I, I work on with my patients in my medical practice and clients in my coaching programs is just how much copper they may be consuming. So this is an app called Chronometer. I use it all the time. It's very helpful and useful for understanding your diet, which is why I use it. Mm -hmm. And most people just have no concept of the ins and outs of how much copper they're actually getting. So this is a typical day of food that I would recommend a, a patient to eat. You'll notice that there's an abundance of omega threes. There's some omega sixes. There's some, you know, saturated fats. There's a balance of these things. There's a lot of minerals, though. It's one of the first things I look for. There's also tons of B vitamins, for the record. Mm. But when we look at the minerals and we zoom in on copper, you see that you get a lot of copper from nuts, from seeds, from grains, basically from vegetable sources. Mm. Uh, that's important because people who are not eating those things may truly have a low copper state right? Mm -hmm. And that means that they may end up with, a, they may benefit significantly from taking high doses of copper. But you also have to remember that copper and manganese and zinc all compete with one another. Mm -hmm. So if you look at manganese, you're going to find that it tends to be very, very rich in certain, mm. uh, some foods really do well with this, like oatmeal has a lot of manganese in it and spinach has a lot of manganese. But mm. mostly it's the nuts and the seeds that you're going to see in the diet supplying the manganese. Mm. And then zinc also uh, competes with copper and manganese. And they all compete with all the divalent cations, which mm. include things that are very rare, like molybdenum. We actually measure supplements for that in micrograms rather than milligrams, you know, because it's so rare. Yeah. And you'll notice here that these numbers sort of ballpark. These are pretty typical, like healthy diet numbers. I wouldn't be surprised to see these for someone coming to me who, who already was pretty savvy with their diet and was eating a balanced diet. And you'll notice that you're, you're getting like, I would call it like two to four milligrams of copper a day for many people in, a, in what we might call a balanced diet. It could be much more than that. It could be much less than that. Hmm. You'll notice that people are coming in with zinc though, particularly people who are not well, cannot tolerate red meat. You know, look at how much of the red meat in this day is supplying the zinc it's you know over a third of the zinc for this day is being supplied by the red meat mm -hmm. if you cut that out all of a sudden you wind up with a very low 
zinc intake. And if you add, say, some beef liver on top of this, you're going to end up with okay. a high copper zinc ratio. And we've seen that wreck people over and over and over and over again. Mm. And that's why we wanted to sit down and talk about this, because people out there are not cognizant of how much load is coming into their diet. And, and you will, you'll find plenty of people who say, look, I can't tolerate red meat. It tears up my stomach. I, I get this terrible abdominal pain. There's no way I can eat more than one or two ounces at a time. What do I do to get my zinc and how do I fix this? And this is where people saying things like never take zinc supplements. Just, I don't think it's responsible. You'll see people out there with low zinc levels. And this is one of the things that woke me up to the importance of hair tissue mineral analysis was that I got all these people's, uh, hair tissue back with their, their blood levels. And there was this overwhelming pattern in women who had fatigue mm. of high copper levels in the blood, low mm. copper levels in the hair, and then low zinc levels in the blood plus or minus in the hair. Right. And they didn't all need zinc because there were other contraindications to that in the HTMA, which we cover in the course with the coaching. If you want to learn how to really interpret these, Right. But they definitely didn't need more copper because mm -hmm. you drive that serum level up, you make them worse. Mm -hmm. Many of them, most of them needed some kind of coaching into a better, uh, more balanced diet. Mm -hmm. But even then you have to be careful that you don't coach them into eating a high copper, low zinc diet mm -hmm. uh, while also getting the other minerals that they need in order to be healthy and well. Yeah. And I mean, it speaks to, I think, um, avoiding extreme diets, basically, whether it's, you know, carnivore for a very long period mm -hmm. of time, yes. with a lot of liver or vegetarianism or veganism for a very long period of time, you will end up, that's part of the reason why, you know, for my clients, and I know for yours as well, and your patients, you know, we both eschew this sort of extreme dietary approach, because over right. the long term, you will end up with imbalances, like there will be big imbalances. Some of the worst uh, imbalances in zinc and copper that I see come from the vegan and vegetarian populations by far. And that's because they're just not getting any zinc. There's a lot more copper in plant foods, but that, so thinking about it that way, it makes sense why an omnivorous diet would, would be optimal because you're getting a balance like zinc and iron are much more rich in uh, animal-based foods, right. along with, like B vitamins, taurine, other things as well. But then plant foods are a very good source of copper um, and like, uh, you know, calcium in, in some cases, magnesium certainly is very rich in a lot of plant foods. So, uh, understanding that there's a balance there and the balance actually between these elements determines your state of health and disease. That's really, I think maybe one of the most important things that people can take away, not only from this webinar, but from the information that we're presenting in the course as well, which is that this, this system the mineral balancing system using HTMA is about measurement and correction of all of these elements all at one time. We're not, right. we're not targeting one element, uh, but it's a balance of the whole system that we're really trying to achieve and really balance in that whole mineral system is, is how you reverse chronic conditions um, permanently, basically, you know? So um, I don't think you're supposed to say that. I don't think we are. Should we edit that out? <laughs> we can't. We're live. We're live. We're live. The um, FDA, if, the FDA, if Clark disappears, it's because the FDA is, you know, abducted him. The FBI, I'm knocking my door. Yeah, we're not claiming to die. To what is it? We're not diagnosing, you know, practicing medicine via the internet. Um, consult your doctor before making changes to your diet and lifestyle, where you don't make any claims about diagnosing or curing any disease. This is for informational purposes only. Something. 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 Insert boilerplate from lawyer here. Yeah, let's uh, let's call your lawyer right now. Let's see. If we can... Oh my gosh, lawyers have ruined this country. They're ruining the world. It's really funny. Jesus has actually Jesus basically dresses down. Other than the Sadducees and the Pharisees, mm -hmm. he really only talks smack about the lawyers. It's the he only other at, profession at he doesn't length. like. At length. Yeah, he dresses down the lawyers, and then he goes hangs out with the publicans and sinners and prostitutes and all that. So anyway. Um, Roxana asks an interesting question about how do life wave patches play into the copper balance slash imbalance. This is why I think life wave patches work. I mm -hmm. think that what they're doing is they're harnessing the copper with GHKCU and AHKCU and other copper peptides, because you have to understand the more loose these, these minerals are, the more mayhem they create. And this is mm -hmm. one thing that is tough with HTMA. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. you'll see something like a high level of say manganese or copper. 
that doesn't mean tons of copper is coming into the system. Exactly. It means that the exactly. system is eliminating that mineral. Yes. And it can be that it's present in the diet or the environment in excess, like say manganese contamination of your water is actually not that uncommon. Uh, yes. It's not a significant amount in the sense that you're not going to wind up in the ER being diagnosed with, um, you know, manganese toxicity. I've never seen a doctor diagnose that, but you'll see that people have this high level of manganese in their hair. And when you, you, when you take measures to help them eliminate that, they'll feel better, right? Things like sauna using other minerals that compete with manganese or that antagonize mm -hmm. manganese. Um, and so that's why I like the life wave patches. I think they help us harness copper and there's a lot of other potential for these patches and pho phototherapy in general. You know, one thing that Clark and I talk about a lot yeah. with people is the importance of sauna. And we both agree that we've seen great results for people with the sauna space. If people want to watch my interview with Brian Richards, it's yeah. in my YouTube uh, videos. Just look up sauna in my YouTube channel and that'll come up. You can get a discount uh, with uh, through the link in that description. Shout out, Brian. Uh, I bought one of his very first saunas when he just Did started you? in 2013 when they were still doing PVC frames. Uh, wow. So we go back a little bit, but, you know, Sauna Space is a phenomenal company, and I just want to shout them out. Um, it's a great product. You know, I know, I know Brian Hoyer, who helped uh, develop, like, the EMF blocking technology on uh, the lights. So... Um, you know, that company, I could not recommend more, I, you know, I don't really recommend a lot of products or different right. companies, but that one sauna space and what Brian has done with those saunas is phenomenal. So Janelle adds, there's an incredible website called coppertoxic.com. Tons of info there. That's very relevant. I'm sure it is. Yes. We're not the only people talking about this, but we find that a lot of people don't bring a balanced perspective to this. And so right. people wind up with this idea that they are safe to just take these massive doses of copper. And they don't realize that even just a couple of capsules of, um, of beef liver will push them over the edge. You know, I've had mm -hmm. more than one serious biohacker health enthusiast of mine have labs come back. And I say, particularly with the men, because women will have an elevated copper level often just because of their estrogen levels. Right. But the men, if a man has a copper over a mm hundred, -hmm. I ask immediately, are you taking beef liver? Mm. Because there's almost no way for them to get those levels in my experience up over 105, 110 into the mm. 120s, 30s, 50s. I've seen as high as 180 in a man taking high doses of beef liver. So anyway, yeah. And one thing that really surprised me about this was I looked at this and I thought, okay, the body's got to have a better way of balancing these things. Mm -hmm. but what then you find when you start to work with people and you measure blood levels is you feel like you're chasing your tail. You say, wow, these, these toxic elements are just always in the blood mm -hmm. and these, these nutritive minerals, they just are never, um, they won't stick. Yeah. Like you'll just dump magnesium into people. You'll get put people on zinc for months and you wonder, you know, why are we requiring such high doses of these minerals in order to normalize this person's mineral status. And this is where I started to find that HTMA gave me a better window into people's physiology to correct these things in a lasting way. Mm -hmm. And I want to explain how that really functions and works. Yes. It has to do with the fact that what your body's eliminating is determined not only by things like hormones and neurotransmitters and stress and sleep and sunlight, but it's actually determined by, you know, fundamental electrochemistry within your body as well as methylation. Mm -hmm. So when you look at an HTMA and you've really learned how to interpret them in a more sophisticated way, and I have to say this, even though I don't, I don't like having to say this, there are a lot of people out there doing HTMA and doing it very poorly. If you go to somebody who puts you on 15, 20, 30 supplements, and says, see in three or four months, I would never go back to them. Or the just the adrenal cocktail. <laughs> just, that, just that as well. Yeah, and you yeah. know, it, it's funny because I'll use that, mm -hmm. but I'm using it in the sense, and I always explain clearly to people like, look, this is not the only thing you need. 
Mm -hmm. You really need to be on this comprehensive protocol mm -hmm. and you can use this if you want a quick boost to your mineral levels, but it is not coming into the system to correct everything. And yeah. so you have to take a comprehensive view of how to correct someone's electrochemistry. For example, if you're mm -hmm. looking at something like, um, and this is the great thing about the HTMA is that if you know how to read it, you'll also dose B vitamins that improve methylation and detoxification yes. through the test. Yes. Otherwise to get at what these pathways are doing, you need something like an organic acid test. Mm -hmm. The organic acid test is nice to have. I enjoy looking at it, but it's also an extra three, $400 mm -hmm. that we don't really need to spend in order to get the same results. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just about the minerals. It's also about the B vitamins that control methylation and elimination mm -hmm. and detoxification within the body. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have that perspective and you aren't fixing the methylation pathways along with the mineral inputs and balances in the diet, you're going to get very mediocre results. And mm -hmm. I see over and over again that the approach of practitioners is use high doses, use them for long periods of time. Um, don't be thoughtful about this. Don't look at ratios of minerals in the HTMA. Don't mm. think about how you can balance those ratios in order to optimize cellular energy production. And then the other thing I would say is that you've got to make sure that the person has the raw nutrients necessary in order to respond in terms of macronutrients. So we see this over and over again. People are in a low protein state. They can't make enough protein in order to do things like create glutathione, your major cellular antioxidant, which helps you to detoxify all these minerals that are present in, um, excess. And so then you, you end up in this picture where you may be taking supplements and they may actually be good for you. And they may be a good form, but you don't have the B vitamins, the amino acids, the fatty acids, et cetera, et cetera, in order to optimally use them. And then you wind up spinning your wheels and wondering why. Um, absolutely. And I think that's maybe a good, uh, segue into using the hair analysis. Yeah. to recommend copper supplements or to avoid copper. And so with the hair analysis, sort of going back to some of the things that I was saying earlier on, copper is very difficult to measure directly. Even, you know, in the serum, it's very difficult because it's a, an acute phase reactant, but that also makes it difficult to measure sometimes directly in the hair. And so low levels of a copper in, in the hair doesn't necessarily mean that you have a need for copper supplementation or that you don't have copper toxicity. So what we do using the hair analysis, and actually it's a little more precise, what we're doing using mineral balancing principles and understanding the interactions between the elements is we can use biomarkers on the test to assess much more precisely, should this person be on copper? Should they not be on copper supplementally? And then the dosing uh, right. really comes into play there as well. And so, there's two very distinct and precise situations. Slow oxidizers in general need to stay away from supplemental copper. There are caveats. If you have a low sodium potassium ratio, we will sometimes use limcomin, which has copper in it, but that's balanced with zinc, hmm. right? So never giving slow oxidizers copper by, by itself ever, um, right? And generally speaking, we're not giving them high doses of copper either. Um, the other situation uh, that's very distinct is in, is when people are in fast oxidation and fast oxidation generally calls for more copper supplementation. And, um, there are two ratios, which we can target, uh, the calcium magnesium ratio and the sodium potassium ratio. And when those two ratios are low, that's a stronger need for copper. So fast oxidizers with a low calcium magnesium ratio, a low sodium potassium ratio, have very, very strong need or very strong supplemental need for copper. And part of this, part of this understanding comes from our knowledge of how copper interacts with both sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. And so to get very precise with this, copper is a calcium synergist, calcium and sodium, and then it's a potassium and mag magnesium antagonist. It will lower potassium and magnesium, it will raise copper, uh, it will raise calcium and sodium. So and if before you... we get deeper into this, I think it's really important to help people understand what we're talking about in general, which is basically mm -hmm. that when hair tissue mineral analysis was first being studied, and it's been around for decades now, 
mm -hmm. uh, by Dr. Paul Eck, he set down what he called the standards and references mm -hmm. for healthy people who were free of medical problems and disease. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the most cool things about NHTMA is that it's not judged based on normal the general normal population. in the united states is rapidly deteriorating right wow. you i mean you walk down the street it's hard to find someone who looks good mm -hmm. let alone moves well and isn't just surgically enhanced right yeah. i mean a lot of these people on social media it's just one filter loaded on top of another with a bunch of makeup and some prosthetics right mm -hmm. so the population is getting sicker we're still using references from the 1980s mm -hmm. of optimal health and what you need to understand is that someone who's really in optimal health and who isn't overstressed, overworked, um, in a toxic environment, toxic relationships, they've got a very clear range of normal ratios in their, in their hair for mineral levels. And it's very remarkable how you can look at somebody's hair and tell them about what's going on in their life. I mean, Clark talked about this a little bit yesterday on our our coaching call with our people who are in our, our hair tissue mineral analysis coaching course, you'll be able to tell them about how they're feeling internally in a very powerful way. Mm -hmm. And then when you, when you balance these minerals and when he says sodium antagonist, potassium agonist or, or synergist, whatever, what he's really talking about is what happens in the hair tissue when you give that thing as a supplement and or increase it in the diet. Because by manipulating all these minerals in a coherent way, you can actually balance the ratios much faster than if you just trust the whole process of, you know, my body will sort itself out. All I have to do is more of this, that, or the other thing. I mean, we've, you know, I, I, from my own personal experience and part of what really convinced me that HTMA was profoundly important mm -hmm. was that I was used to using 30 milligram doses of zinc because no one had shown me how to use higher doses. And then I started to use higher doses of zinc at Clark's suggestion mm -hmm. and got very different results. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about that in context, what I want you all to understand is that if you think about how long it's going to take you eating a regular diet to get an extra 30 milligrams of zinc a day, mm -hmm. not going to happen. You'd have to eat like three or four steaks and you'd have, <coughs> to, and you'd have to absorb the zinc from those steaks. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. Now we're talking about 60 extra milligrams of zinc. Mm -hmm. The same thing can be true of copper. You know, there are situations in which you'll use a higher dose of copper, right? Um, and if you go back and look at the data I, I shared from a typical day of a typical person's diet, you know, eating two to three milligrams of copper a day, well, how on earth are you going to get to four or five or six milligrams a day? Mm -hmm. You're going to be eating cashews or pistachios or pecans for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you're going to get tired of eating the sheer quantity of food, let alone the macros that you may need in order to get high doses of these trace elements. And this often people come back and say, well, wait a minute, why are we needing these high, high doses in our modern world, which is another great topic, right? You know, we live in a world where we're set up for copper toxicity because we have copper piping in certain homes where the copper is going to get into the water supply and then all the food. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fan of using copper to store uh, water or drink out of, uh, po copper pitchers or cooking in copper lined cookware. I don't think that's a good idea, particularly mm. in our modern world. You'll see that women who've been on some kind of hormonal, uh, replacement of any kind of estrogen will tend to have copper toxicity and will tend to have higher levels of copper in their blood. Mm -hmm. I've seen levels as high as 215 on birth mm. control. And so what people are set up for this high copper situation, and then they have, um, I'm not exactly sure. I, I have my suspicions about why zinc levels are low chronically in the public. I think it's over farming. It's depletion of our soils. It's a lack of or failure to put zinc into our uh, soil amendments or fertilizers. I also think it has to do with stress, poor sleep, chronic activation of our um, bioenergetic system, so to speak, mm -hmm. then running those zinc stores down. But it's just overwhelming that you see this pattern where people are generally more in need of zinc than copper across the population. True, true. And and that's true in my practice as well, where um, there are situations, even in the situations where we give higher dose copper, we're still giving zinc with it, um, which I think kind of speaks to another really interesting idea or principle here. And this goes back to the interactions uh, that I was talking about before, 
but there are these mineral interactions, right? And a lot of people know of like zinc and copper are directly antagonistic, uh, less well known that, that copper and calcium are synergistic or, you know, uh, you can raise calcium by giving copper. Obecker mm. uh, noticed this in some of his work. And this was also done by William Albrecht and then Paul Eck, Dr. Paul Eck uh, did this with the hair analysis. But um, the interactions are even more complicated than even what we're saying here, where yes, zinc and copper are antagonistic to one another, but there are situations where if you give copper along with the zinc, the zinc will be better utilized when you give the copper along with it. And that's true for iron and copper as well, where they're directly antagonistic to one another at higher doses um, and above certain thresholds. But copper is required for iron utilization to mobilize iron from the storage into the active form. Yes. And so this the interactions piece really speaks to the complexity of it and understanding the minerals in a systems based approach is really what we're doing with mineral balancing and having that understanding will help to sort of blow out of the water this other paradigm which most people are using which is let's focus on one individual element we can give that in perpetuity and people will be fine you know all most of my clients including myself we all tried those approaches and they failed miserably over time we had that come up yesterday somebody who we were talking to had been on a protocol that was high in copper for about a year absolutely ruined her health. She came to you, you yep. started to do hair tissue mineral analysis and balancing. Mm -hmm. She described the results as unbelievably good. All of her doctors were puzzled as to how she reversed the problems that she reversed. Yeah. And the rest is, uh, is history. Yeah. And I think that what's interesting about that too, is that when you get into the hair tissue mineral analysis community, mm -hmm. I don't see almost anyone talking well i don't know if anyone but I, I do see that amongst people who really talk about htma mm -hmm. and really think about it that they they very few of them gravitate towards a you all need more of this approach mm -hmm. because they've just seen if you've done enough htmas if you right. spend enough time with people you know you know that you will be surprised by what will come out on the next test and that's another thing that's really important for people to understand is that when we're looking at these tests our goal isn't just to say, oh, well, this is low or the, that is low and, you know, this is, you know, high. So we need to give something that antagonizes it. It's, it's to look at the system and say, how can we bring what I call the nutritive minerals in balance, the ones that you need and that are essential for optimal health and longevity. Mm. But once you balance those things and you restore bioenergetic potential to the body, it begins to push out the toxic metals Mm -hmm. And that is where you really see the magic happen. And you see people's aluminum levels, you know, just the other week, I, one of this great case study in exactly this topic, she had mm -hmm. low copper on her first test. It jumps up to, you know, from two to like 6.5. So a 3.5 fold increase or 3.25 fold increase. Mm -hmm. And then you see her aluminum level jumped by 20, 20 fold. This mm. isn't someone who took up cooking in aluminum pots and pans. They didn't start okay. using a copper supplement. Their intake of these minerals and metals was the same. Mm. And that was one thing that really boggled my mind when I started to look at this is I said, people will come to me and have the exact same intake of these things. But, you know, month to month, their expression of that intake in their blood may be radically different. And then mm -hmm. in their hair, it's also different. Very so you have to take a longer view of these timescales and be prepared to follow a protocol that's going to help you balance them, not just today and tomorrow, but for the next three months. And then you've got to be prepared to retest yes. because you're not going to have, I mean, I'm retesting every six weeks now, my hair yeah. and you're retesting every three months. I think you mentioned that the other day. Yeah. And we rely on it now to really maintain uh, optimal performance. Yes. And, and what I would say, another really important point that you brought up <coughs> is this notion of heavy metals and minerals competing with one another. Mm, I part remember, reason, yeah. yeah. Part of the reason why zinc is so low in society in general, in the population is because most of the metals compete or can displace zinc um, in various places. This includes aluminum, nickel, lead, cadmium, mercury, all of those can displace zinc. And when that occurs, this is sort of another hidden reason for copper toxicity. When this occurs, 
like if you are exposed to metals, that will lower your zinc. Copper and zinc exist in that exquisite balance as well. You can end up with copper right. toxicity for that reason, right? Yes. And for the record, mm -hmm. I know that Clark and I are a little out there in our thinking for a lot of people who are not necessarily into integrative and holistic and functional medicine or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. But this is not just, you know, Dr. Stillman and Clark Engelbert, like make uh, this up on the fly. This uh, is a real element of the literature. This is a simple Google Scholar yeah. search for ionic mimicry. There you go. There are 33,000 results for this concept in the yep. literature. Yep. You know, exactly. and you, these are a lot of these are new concepts. You know, you look at the dates yes. on these, it's in the 2000s. You know, we got one back here from 1993. Mm -hmm. One of the sad facts about conventional medical training and biochemistry is that unfortunately, the system is not set up to embrace ideas that are good and new. Max Planck, uh, famous quantum physicist, said science does not advance because old scientists are convinced of new ideas and reform or change their minds. It advances because old scientists die and are replaced by new scientists who are familiar with fresh ideas. That's sometimes paraphrased as science advances one funeral at a time. And we really live in a time where the like aging, decaying edifice of modern medicine is being run by these totally out of touch lunatics who think that everything, the solution for everything is more authoritarian, crazy measures restricting your freedom, restricting your liberty, um, basically pushing you into these bizarre states of over-medication and um, poor health. Whereas you look at the minerals and how you can restore someone to health by, by properly nourishing them and you become really compelled. This is really the only thing that you can do, particularly for me as a medical doctor. You know, Hippocrates famously said, the greatest medicine of all is teaching people how not to need it. This is the best way for me to actually do that short of all the, you know, diet and lifestyle stuff that I talk about. That's more kind of, um, it's much more one size fits all right. Mm -hmm. Like this is how I approach sun exposure. This is light therapy. This is sauna. This is, you know, what I recommend for getting to sleep at night and your optimal circadian rhythms, things like that. But you just can't beat the hair tissue mineral analysis in my opinion for how exquisite it is for telling you what's going on with the person and, how you can help them with the right combination of supplements by balancing those minerals and therefore the electrical potential in the cell. A hundred percent. And I think you, you touching on bringing up some of the literature, uh, looking at ionic mimicry, which is this concept that the metals gain access to cellular compartments in the first place mm. through mineral channels and transporters. This is right. maybe the most important concept that anyone, if they take nothing else away from our course, or from this webinar or from all the information that we're putting out separately on social media, this concept helps us to understand the dynamics of metal toxicology in the first place. How do metals get in the cells in the first place? Through mineral channels and transporters. And usually metals are absorbed more efficiently, more readily in the face of these mineral imbalances and deficiencies. And that's how that ties together that metals piece of the hair analysis and the minerals, the minerals are all interacting in this system. And then the metals actually interact in that system as well in that specific way. So uh, it is not pie in the sky. It's there's a lot of literature on this. If I had not started this business, I was on a track to go into research. And, you know, this area would have been my specialty, would have been the focus of my research, um, you know, but bringing up where it comes from, I think is really important because in, in the hair analysis space, a lot of people don't even know when was hair analysis first proposed, right? To actually be used as a recording filament for uh, the, the neutral developments 19, in the 1940s by a PhD MD in dermatology named Peter Flesh, right? Um, and then where does ionic mimicry come from? Where is the idea that minerals and metals interact in the system come from? So understanding that this stuff is actually very tangible, very legitimate, um, you know, where does the idea that minerals interact actually come from? There was a lot of papers done in the early 1970s by these two researchers, Hill and Matrone, who proposed that certain metals and minerals with similar physiochemical characteristics would directly compete for absorption. That idea was proposed and then it was basically uh, 
confirmed in a lot of experimental studies that they did thereafter. And that's why we know that zinc and copper interact uh, and, and right. metals as well, right? So, and then where does ionic mimicry come from? After it was discovered that the metals and the minerals interact in the system and there are these interactions, that's when there was this proposition of this idea of ionic mimicry in 1980, right after uh, about a decade after the concept of this mineral system was proposed. And then there were researchers who elaborated on this and the specifics of it, what metals replace what minerals. So there's an entire body of research looking at the specific dynamics of these interactions. And I actually spoke with one of those researchers who did a lot of this research post-1980, Christy Bridges, who uh, has her own lab at Mercer University. She studies mercury and cadmium toxicity in the kidneys. Um, and she has a phenomenal landmark paper from around 2005, 2006, looking at ionic and molecular mimicry. Ionic mimicry is where the, metal, the minerals interact and the metals interact, but the metals uh, and the minerals can also interact with endogenous biomolecules like your hormones, right? And this is maybe another really roundabout important point to make about estrogen and copper. All of the metals, they can mimic many of the different minerals, but all of the metals are mimics for estrogen as well. And so they can raise estrogen, they can stimulate estrogen, higher estrogen levels equals more copper toxicity, more copper retention in the tissues. So these, a lot of these concepts and ideas are basically buried in the literature and there are not a lot of people looking, uh, you know, for better solutions and, and for a tangible basis for these concepts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's really funny that you're saying this because I think that people, um, let me show you guys some quick, this is again, because I think, you know, particularly with my conventional medical background, I can just imagine my colleagues watching this and thinking like, what's Dr. Stillman smoking? You know, what is he talking <laughs> about? How can minerals mimic hormones? Doesn't make any sense, but look, heavy metals as endocrine disrupting chemicals all the way back in 2007. Mm -hmm. the toxic doppelganger on the ionic and molecular mimicry of cadmium. You, if you go through these papers, you're going to see that these heavy metals do affect your hormone system. If you go to something like the environmental working group and look at their list of the top endocrine disrupting chemicals in the environment, you're going to see that things like aluminum, cadmium, mercury, arsenic are on the list. Mm -hmm. And these are ubiquitous elements in our environment. You know, the, the case I talked about earlier where we saw this big elimination of copper, this big elimination in the hair of aluminum, she mm -hmm. tripled her hair concentration of mercury. That's not uncommon. <clears throat> once you fix the mineral intakes in the diet through supplementation and dietary changes, mm -hmm. not to mention things like sauna, all of a sudden people start to push out these toxic metals because they have the energy to do so. And that's the thing is that mm -hmm. the body has the capacity to heal. The body has the capacity to detoxify itself. You don't need a million and one dollars or devices of stuff to throw at this, what you need is an artful approach that's based on decades and decades of clinicians like Clark and I actually working directly with people, mm -hmm. observing their results. And this is one reason why the conventional medical community is totally long on this and has no idea the value that they're missing mm -hmm. is they think of this in terms of, oh, the patient doesn't have an absolutely low serum zinc or copper level, therefore zinc or copper supplementation will not make them any better, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the patient is not flatlining from lack of, you know, physical exercise, but it doesn't mean physical exercise isn't good for them, right? And one thing that you'll notice across the literature is that generally speaking, when people eat a mineral dense diet mm -hmm. and people, when they eat, when they don't take tons of supplements and they don't follow a wildly restrictive diet, they tend to naturally eat a variety of foods that supply mm -hmm. them with a wide range of different minerals, vitamins, other nutrients, Mm -hmm. which is a big part of why you won't catch me saying things like all of you need to eat spinach or all of you need to right. be eating cashews or, Oh, you really should focus on lamb instead of bison or elk instead of beef. Right. These mm -hmm. kind of simplistic things, they fall apart in the real world when you're taking care of N of one people, you know, you are an N of one, you are a category of one. 
you are unique. You deserve to have people taking care of you who view you that way and who are going to prescribe or recommend things to you based on real data from your case to understand what you need in order to get you the results you want. And results are another thing that I, I talk about constantly now. Mm -hmm. I was never taught to talk about results as a medical student or a resident with patients. I was just taught mm. to assume the result that everybody wanted. Mm. And I've realized that one of the most important things to do when you're taking care of people is help them define their goals. Because a lot of people, and we run into this with the hair tissue, right? Is we see someone who's exhausted and we say, look, you know, you're exhausted. You need to slow down. You need to relax. You need to rest. And they say something like, well, you know, that's great, but I have three kids. I'm a single parent. I have a mortgage. I have bills. I basically, I need you to prop me up with whatever you can use so that mm -hmm. I can get through the next two to three years until the kids graduate from high school or until, you know, I close my next business deal or until I sell my business or until you know, we finally, uh, resolve this, you know, insert acute, serious psychosocial issue here. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's why, again, I don't really like the paradigm that you're also going to see out there, which is essentially, um, you know, have us test your labs or have us, you know, do a remote testing kit, and then we'll send you a, uh, uh, like a report and a bag of supplements to go with it. Or this is what you need to take because this is what your lab results are. I've seen that just go wildly, wildly wrong. Plus most people have underlying problems with their diet and their lifestyle, which by the way, we coach people on that in our fundamentals of wellness course, we help them understand what all the foundational things are so that when they come into a one-on-one -on -one or a, another kind of consultation with Clark or I, we're not covering basic low hanging fruit that can be covered in things like videos for educational modules, a course online, or group coaching sessions and things like that. You're actually getting the most out of your time with us. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, one other thing I think we could use uh, or talk about to button things up is hmm. some of the very, uh, there's a very interesting concept uh, that many of these minerals have psychological effects on people. Yes. Influence the way that you think, your behavior, yeah. thought patterns. Uh, you know, we talked about this yesterday in the uh, group coaching session. But in terms of like the ratios of the minerals and patterns, how they influence how you think. But right. each individual element has very specific chemical characteristics. People know of copper as like a conductor of electricity, right? It's used in the wiring in people's homes for this reason. When copper builds up in your brain beyond a certain threshold, it has that same property of uh, conductiveness of electricity. It will conduct electrical signals across the neurons much more rapidly. It will lead to directly overthinking disorders, uh, you know, anxiety, anxiety, panic attacks, not feeling like you can switch off. Exactly. And that's sort of switching attention from one thing to another. These really struggling these, to commit or settle down or focus or remain calm under pressure. And zinc, as you were mentioning, or I think you were about to probably mention, has the opposite profile. Exactly. It's called the gentle masculine mineral. It tends to help people feel calm and grounded and relaxed, focused, able to put up with or deal with adversity, negativity, setbacks. And this is why, you know, people, I mean, are regularly coming to Clark or I after we do an HTMA and saying things like, I've never felt this focused. I've never felt this well. Mm. I feel like I have my energy back. I mean, this is the kind of thing that we are spoiled by in, in, in reviews and testimonials by people because this is exactly how it works. And it sounds weird to say things like, oh, the zinc has this like personality, right? But when you mm -hmm. see it come out over and over and over again after you All tailor right. these protocols to people, you think, oh my gosh, there's something really here that mm -hmm. we can see and that we can use to help people understand why they are the way they are. Yeah, exactly. There could be, I mean, there are volumes written on the effects that minerals have on your neurochemistry. Metals mm -hmm. have this effect as well. Right. So it's in like, yeah. in, it's in the medical, it's in the like. Uh, it is, but the thing is it, 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 the, the way that the medical literature is generated, it hasn't created mm -hmm. a, you know, everything has to be some kind of double blinded randomized placebo controlled trial right. and everything has to be, you know, objectively quantified from, you know, zero to a hundred. Mm -hmm. And I agree that there's a time and a place for that, but it also, you lose 
the sensitivity to how does the patient feel? Right. And another thing that they never taught me in medical school or residency was the most important thing for you to understand is how the patient's feeling. I mm -hmm. figured that out one day after another, because if you walk into the patient's room and they say, I'm feeling better, then almost certainly you're doing something right. There still may be things that you've missed. There may be diagnoses that need to be made. You may mm -hmm. need to continue treatment or imaging or lab testing, but fundamentally you're going in the right direction. We'll often run into this with the HTMA because people will say, Hey, wait a minute, my mercury, my aluminum, my, this is worse or mm. my copper's worse or my zinc or my chromium or my selenium dropped, but I feel better. What mm. happened? Right. Mm. And we'll say you're getting better. You feel better. Other markers like HRV, sleep scores, energy levels, readiness scores on fitness trackers, objective blood work from the conventional world, like CBCs, CMPs, kidney function, liver function, whatever that may be better. Mm. Right. Uh, but the hair gets worse sometimes or often because you're getting all this toxic waste out and you're helping the person balance their physiology, uh, which frankly is more important than, I mean, anything, yeah. I think. Yeah, it's really that balancing of the whole system that we're doing with with using HTMA and, and really, um, you know, sometimes people get it confused. They think that the HTMA, there's some inherent characteristic of the hair analysis that's you know, that is what we're using or what we're doing. The mm. HTMA is a vehicle for mineral balancing. And I think understanding it that way will help open people's minds up to a different way to think about the HTMA than just like the individual mineral levels themselves, right? When you or I look at the HTMA, it's much more, we think about it in terms of the entire mineral system is being measured all at one time. Yes. We're not measuring the individual elements. And so understanding that coming from the systems based approach of the minerals exist in a system, all of the elements interact in that system. We're using the hair test to actually measure that whole system all at one time. And that's really where the value and the use of it comes in. And then we can apply right. all these principles that we've been talking about, the interactions that occur, ionic mimicry, which ties together the metals and the minerals, but it's really that understanding in the first place that the minerals exist in a system and we're using the hair test to measure that system basically is really uh, sort of a foundational concept or principle of, of all of this work. Yes. So people can watch Clark's and my webinar on HTMA. I posted that in the comments. It explains more about why we're running the course, what the course entails as well as helping you understand more of the kind of nuts and bolts and basics of HTMA. So you understand the value. And then I also posted a link to the HTMA waiting list. That's a list that you can join where we'll notify you when the course with coaching is open again. Again, we had a overwhelming amount of demand. I think we have about 120 people on the waiting list for the next round. And we've got people already asking us in the program how they can continue to be engaged and they are going to get a special uh, offer that if you join the course, you know, at any point, you'll, you'll also get the opportunity to continue working with us um, in that capacity. We are going to be running that next, I think we said August, September, October, end of October is when we'll be doing another webinar on this. Yep. It'll be, I think the fourth week, end of October or so. And then we will get into uh, enrolling people in that course. So make sure you're on the waiting list because that's who will get the first crack as well as the people who are already in the course, they'll get the first email so they can keep keep working with us. Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, the course has been really, really fun for anyone that is interested. It's a really good right. dynamic. We go over in the course, the group coaching, I should say, the group coaching is me and Dr. Stillman going over your individual hair analysis. So, you know, if you're a little shy, maybe, uh, you know, you need to work on that, but we, you're getting a lot of in-depth. We don't uh, have to, if you don't want us to, and we're happy to send yeah. you some you know, information or recommendations, but we also, you know, we found that most people are not embarrassed enough about their hair mineral content to not want to cover it in a group setting. And that's the best way for you all to learn because exactly. you get to see, you know, 20 or 30 of these things being covered. Exactly. And that really gives you enough of a background to really help people if you're a practitioner um, or even if you're just a lay person and you want to be interpreting these for friends and family. Although I can't say that I recommend that. I think there's enough here that you should really commit to being a professional and doing it full time if you're going to. Yeah, exactly. And that's really the value in the group coaching is 
we are going over dozens and dozens of tests. That's really how you get good at analyzing hair tests is you analyze right. hair tests over because and over. Because there's a lot of details to work through. A lot of details. So, yeah, and we, we get into all of that. So yeah, right. it's really beneficial for practitioners. Also, if you are just interested in it, you're going to get a ton of value and information out of it that way as well. Right. And on that note, thanks everyone for tuning in. Make sure you're on the stillmanwellness.com email list because we are now doing mon we're doing more free webinars like this and you'll get notifications about them through uh, that channel pr primarily. But Jim and I are also doing um, webinars every Thursday at 10 that are not streamed to social media because they're too hot and they're uncensored. And so they're gonna be exclusively for people who are on our list. And if you're, um, if, if you don't catch it live, it's going to be in the programs that we're selling as courses down the line. So it's a really good incentive for you to block that 10 a.m. Thursday and get on our email list so you don't miss a beat because these webinars are going to be very, very valuable. Yes. And then uh, if you guys want to follow me on social media, yes. I am nutritional underscore analytics. That's my main social media channel. I've been hitting it hard. You mean Instagram. Instagram? You forgot yes. that part. Yeah, Instagram, exactly. <laughs> right. So yep. thanks everyone for tuning in. Take care. Have a great day. Don't forget to get outside.